Good evening, everyone. Thank you, as always, for joining me this evening. I've got a really, really interesting conversation for you this evening. And I want to, before we start, um, say a, a sincere thanks to our guest this evening. It's, it's very personal uh, what he's going to share with us this evening. Um, and you'll find it very interesting, which as I do. So let's crack on. I want to introduce you to Reese. Uh, Good evening, Reese. How are you? Hello. I'm doing well. A little good. bit of a midday tired, but I'm good. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for taking the time to come on and talk to us. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and I do know what, what a personal issue this is for you. Mm. Um, so I'm very grateful to you for talking to us about it. So let's start at the beginning. Um, you have, you are what we would call a detransitioning. De yeah. Is that is that a fair description yeah okay so let's start at the very beginning so i want to ask you first of all about your childhood not not in, in any great detail just about this one of the things that we hear now just to be you know to be clear everyone has their their own story to tell and, and yours is yours hmm. we hear all the time that you've got you've got a scenario now where young children four five six years of age are being trans and what they will, what we'll be told is that children, even young children, feel like they are a girl trapped in a boy's body or a boy trapped in a girl's body, etc. Is that how you felt as a child? How? Tell us your. Tell us from. Is that how you felt as a child? With hindsight in mind, um, yeah. It was fun to fantasize as a kid, uh, for sure. And you could quite easily turn that fantasy into something that is supposed to be real. Okay. Or it could be left as a fantasy, depending on how other people treat you in regards to it. Yeah. So there were, it was definitely in my mind that it would be fun to be a girl, that it would be nice to be a girl, that I would fit in as a girl. But in my youngest days, it was just that. It was just a fantasy. It was just a passing thought. Okay. Okay, and do you think that, I mean, looking back, I mean, I was a tomboy as a kid, and I can, I can, I'm pretty certain that if I, if we were living today, I would have, people would have told me that I was a boy living in a girl's body, and I never wanted to be a boy, it wasn't, it just, but that's the, do you think that if someone at that point had said, you're a girl, you would have believed them, you would have, it would have it reinforced this fantasy, as you call it? Yeah, and I think that's exactly what happened just a little bit later on than childhood. Okay. All right. Well, tell us about that, please, Ree. So, when what happened? Where were where were you? What happened? Why? When did you decide to to that transitioning was what you wanted to do? So, a little bit of context to how I ended up in that position. I was quite sure of myself growing up. Like I knew it was at first a fantasy, because um, I had my best friend who you know I could always talk to about these kinds of things and. I would bounce it off him and he'd come back and say, no, that's just, that's kind of stupid. And, you know, we kept each other sort of on the straight and narrow that way. And I had uh, my girlfriend that I'd met as a teenager. Um, we basically grew up together. And as we got older, we decided to officially call it a relationship. And she too would say things like, well, that would be stupid because then, you know, that would make her gay or something along those lines. She, she had had all kinds of, fun ways to describe why it would be stupid. And eventually the the fantasy as it was just got put out of my head. And I would say from the ages of about 13 up to 18 or 19, I didn't think about it anymore. It was only around those late teen years that my best friend and my girlfriend died within a year of each other, both in motorcycle related accidents. And um, from there, I sort of spiraled out of control. I didn't have my anchor anymore. I didn't have any grounding. So I tried to look for new friends. And of course, the internet was really coming into prevalence at the time. So I jumped on the internet and did a quick search for some friends. And I started to find friends. And of course, they, they had quite a progressive leaning. And um, they, it sort of went downhill from there. I went to college. I met more progressives. So there were more progressives online. I was being surrounded by progressive type people. 
And when I brought this thing up that I had gone through in my childhood, you know, this weird sort of fantasy of being a girl, you know, dressing in the wrong clothes every now and then, it was exciting, stuff like that. They said, oh, no, this is serious. This is a real thing. So it's almost as if I'd gone back to being a child and now somebody had said, it's not a silly fantasy. It's, it's real. Now you have to act on this. And that was what I think started the idea that transition was the right thing to do, coupled with just generally not fitting in because I was quite a manly bloke. And this was the time when being manly was not that, um, not that popular, I guess. So you, you were vulnerable. You were in a vulnerable place because you'd suffered great loss, mm. a friend and a girlfriend at, at the same time, effectively. Um, and you'd gone, you'd gone to college and, and, and met these, these people, and you brought up the fact that you felt this way as a child. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember what sparked the conversation, but I sort of offhandedly mentioned that I did used to play dress up and that I had this image of the an, of a female me in my mind kind of thing. And that sort of passing conversation then became very serious with these people on, online and in college. And why do I mean what kind of why do you think this I mean what is it are they, were these people who were trans themselves or were they just Oh what? yeah, there was definitely there was a couple of transgender people in the group who yeah. at the time I had no real opinion of it. They were just other people. And that's kind of how I always viewed people when I was younger, is it didn't matter what traits you had, you were just another person. So it wasn't that yeah. special to me at the time. But as this whole thing progressed, I really started to notice that they were also transgender. I, I think that also contributed to a feeling of belonging. What happened? What happened after that? I mean, what, what, so was there a point, was there a moment when you thought, okay, I'm going to start quote living as a, as a woman. And how did you start that process? So it was through talking to these peers online and in college, um, that this idea became more and more serious and less of a fantasy. Uh, so I went to my doctor and my doctor is, he's a wonderful doctor, um, very impartial. He didn't say one way or the other. He didn't affirm or deny anything to do with gender transition. He referred me straight on to a gender clinic. When I went to the gender clinic, there was quite a lot of affirmation from uh, staff and therapists and other people in the clinic. And, um, there was very little skepticism really in there. So I, I think that sort of snowballed once I got to the gender clinic, it sort of, it snowballed on. And how did it, I mean, did it give you a, did it give you a place in the world? Did it make you feel, did it validate you? Did it, did it make you, did it, were you less confused or more confused with all this affirmation? I think at the time it felt great because I felt like I wasn't, fitting into society I didn't have a place as a young manly man quite aggressive and competitive I didn't really feel like there was a place for me um I knew this reality by the way and like I hadn't seen anything in terms of conservative uh commentary or anything from the other side of the fence it was just this world that I existed in and the progressive college and the progressive online friend group so it really did make me feel like I was fitting in, like I was making the right choices and I was going to have a happier life. And all of the people around me were affirming this at the time. Looking back, I mean, do you, the doctor, you said the doctor sent you straight to a gender clinic. Do you mm. think that was the right thing to do? I think with the tools at his disposal and the job he's supposed to do, I think that is the best he could have done. As obviously, he's not really supposed to have an opinion on these kinds of things. But I don't really hold any ill will to my doctor. I think he did the best he could in the situation. And at the gender clinic, it was just affirmation, affirmation, affirmation. There was only one narrative. Almost, almost all the way, yeah. There was one, um, I think, I'm not sure if there were a therapist or an endocrinologist, but it was an older gen. And he was he basically contacted my parents and said that he didn't think that my uh, gender dysphoria was sincere and of course because i was surrounded by all these progressive types and all this affirmation my first go-to was to dismiss him as a transphobic so 
that happened a lot, honestly. Um, my middle brother also didn't think that this was the right thing to do. And my middle brother had been somebody who kept me on the straight and narrow as I was growing up. Like he kept me looking for jobs. He kept me from falling into bad habits, like you know, smoking and drinking, things like that. But when he dissented from this particular thing, I'd been so conditioned at this point that I disowned him almost instantly. My second oldest brother, who was my role model growing up, he wanted to dissent from it, but he didn't want to upset me. So we ended up sort of becoming awkward and distant, even though he was, like I say, he, he was my role model growing up. I didn't have a father figure growing up, so it was my oldest brother. And do you, um, how old were you at this point? To 18, 19? Um, when I started the transition properly, I think it would have been about 25. Oh, okay. So quite late. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd spent a long time sort of deliberating back and forth on it. But like I said, this was the only reality I knew. So it seemed like the way forward. So how soon after you went to the gender clinic did you start to the actual transition? Um, I think it was within a couple of months I got a prescription for the testosterone blockers, I think it was Spiro something, and the estrogen tablets. And then I was on the start of the two years living in Roll. And it only took a couple of months to get there. Okay. So the first, the first, so you're, you're in the Jenner Clinic and, and they start to give you drugs. They, what kind of drugs did they work? Yeah, it, yes, it, is, and... it wasn't straight away. It was three or four months, maybe, I think. It's kind of fuzzy to remember that bit. But the medicine I remember was called spirolactane or something like that. I don't remember the exact name, but it was a testosterone or free androgen blocker um, and a estrogen tablet. I can't remember what that one was called either. It was a two milligram tablet, oestrogen or something like that. And um, once I was on those, I started to notice a change straight away. What were the changes like? Um, I lost a lot of my aggressive tendencies. I wasn't quite so quick to be confrontational, which at the time I thought was a fantastic thing. Um, obviously, my body started to change shape pretty quickly. I have not got rid of all of that. This is not a, a weight issue you're seeing here. This is my chest is quite pronounced, even with a binder. Um, and overall, I just sort of felt a lot more subdued and calm. Not like I'd been sedated, but like the the need to compete and prove myself had been taken away with this medicine. And and physically, you, you grew breasts. Yes, um, quite prominent as well. I lost quite a bit of muscle mass because I used to be able to lift a lot. I mean, we had I worked a lot on cars. Cars are my first and most important passion in life. And that also played a part in this. Um, I used to do the bullheaded things, like if a car was in the wrong place in the workshop, I'd pick it up by the wheel arch and slide it across the workshop. Wow. When we were trying to put an engine on the crane, because it was just a block, so it wasn't you know all the accessories that make it really heavy, it was just the block. I squatted down, I deadlifted it up, and the guy locked it in with the chains. And he was like, why did you do that? You could put a jack under it. It just felt like doing it that way. <laughs> But I lost all that strength to the point where a lot of the manual tasks that I generally do, you know, like keeping the garden, decorating, and I mean, I'm in the middle of decorating right now, there's that ladder behind me. I was not doing quite so well with those anymore. And I've definitely become a whole lot less manly very quickly. And these two years that you live as a woman, what, mm. is, what does that look like? What did we, you started wearing women's clothes? Yeah. Did Started you wearing, wear or wear a wig or what, what was what what was that like? What did that look like? I had quite long hair and it was a, a dark blonde color naturally. Um, I I just sort of always had long hair because I was a little bit of a rock type personality going on. Um, but yeah, started wearing women's clothes, softened the voice, uh, started getting laser depilation, so the beard on my cheeks and jawline just doesn't grow anymore. This is all that survived the, I think it was 14 sessions of laser depilation, was just a little goatee. Um, softened my voice and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's been a long time since I've done the feminine voice, but it was it was decent enough that most times I answered the phone, it would be hello, miss, and, or hello, love, or things like that. 
and you basically have to live in role for two years before you can be considered for surgery and things like that. And you, so you did that for two years. How yeah. how how are you treated? How was life for you? What who were your friends? What did you work? What was life like? The people, the friends that I'd made through the college and through online, um, they were you know rallying around me like I was doing the beautiful and brave thing. So I had a group of friends that seemingly I could never lose, no matter what I did. Uh, work was difficult because um, I was struggling in college at this point as well, just struggling to make ends meet, work, you know, in college, working part-time, things like that. So I didn't have a job at the time to worry about in terms of making this change. So I dropped out of a job, I started going through this change, and then I came back into a job. And the new job, as you might expect, just they didn't bring it up. <laughs> they didn't say anything about it. Um, like I said, I fell out with a couple of my family members because, you know, I was I was told to dismiss them as transphobic. Um, other than that, I didn't really have any friends left over from the time before because, you know, the two friends that had passed on, they were sort of my branch into all the other friends that I had. So when I didn't have that go-between, I fell out of touch with, I guess, my classic friends, my old friends. So you have your, your two years under your belt. What happened then? Uh, then it was a case of the, the consultations and the therapy really stepped up and gearing towards the surgery thing. And I brought that back to my group of friends and um, brought that back to my mother, who, of course, you know, a mother always wants to be supportive. So my mother was very affirming of this as well. I don't hold any ill will against her. She's just doing what mothers do. Um, and through all of that affirmation and through this increase in the intensity of the consultations and therapy, I was led to the conclusion and I also brought, brought myself to the conclusion that it was the right time to go for surgery about 26, going on 27 years old. And tell us about the surgery. Uh, so when I was going into the, the hospital after it had been confirmed that I'd lived in role for long enough, I think I was almost at three years at this point. Um, at the time, I was honestly quite excited because I thought I was going to come out the other side of this with a whole new body and a whole new feeling and be able to indulge many new pleasures. As um, I think by this time, I was openly bi, and I don't think it was ever a sexual attraction. It was just wanting to be close to people. And I, I guess in a way, I thought that this was going to let me be closer to more people. So I was excited at the time. Uh, and then when I woke up after the surgery and lifted up the sheets and looked down. I was like, oh, so that really happened and I can't go back from that. And that was sort of the first little little inkling of doubt, but I still had my friend group at the time, so I didn't worry about it. I still had the people to go back to. So just to be clear, and I, I know this is all really, really personal, but your, your genitals were removed in this surgery? Yes, completely sterile now. I don't have any natural sex hormones either, so I'm on medication for the rest of my life. You are, this is, you know, it's an incredible thing. So you, you wake up in hospital, you had said you had your first inkling of doubt at that point. How yeah. did life progress from there? How did you, you were, presumably you, this was your womanhood on its, um, how, what, what was life like after that? What, so it, w it was interesting after that, because now that I felt like I was quote unquote complete, I started venturing into all kinds of new experiences, so to speak. And I had that group of friends who were just endlessly affirming and constantly praising me. Um, but from there, I felt like I now had the confidence and the body in the presentation that I could now go and see more of the world as the me that I thought that I wanted to be. So off I went to America, of course, um, being told that America's quite transphobic and all of this kind of stuff, especially the rural areas, the Republican areas that say, oh, they're very transphobic. You don't want to go there and all this kind of nonsense that it turned out to be. Because when I was in America, I went to rural Kentucky, uh, rural Indiana. I think I was there a total of 12 months. I encountered 
no issues, no bigotry of any kind. In fact, a lot of people were just fascinated because I had quite a strong English accent at the time. So it was lovely. And that was also sort of the first part of the awakening to the mistake that I'd made. Explain that. Uh, you, people were, were kind and, and uh, accepting of you, but this, this awakened you to a mistake you'd made. How, in what way? Oh, as I was saying about the universe, the college, and I've made it to university, the colleges yeah. and the online friend group I had, that little circle was my entire reality. Yeah. All of those progressive type things were my entire reality. So when I went to America and I met people who live outside of this reality because they seceded from this sort of overbearing government control of everything you're allowed to see and hear, I started to see and hear other opinions. I started to see people actually living a free life, as in, you know, they're free to make their own choices and make their own way in life. People who'd worked as hard as I'd worked and come out way higher up the ladder than I had. So it started to really open my eyes to there's a whole world outside of this progressive reality that I'd basically grown up in and transitioned in. So you, was it a, a matter of you felt you could have been yourself in this realm of freedom if, if you hadn't been... Is that, is that, am I getting clear? I mean... Yeah. I think if I'd been born in America and grown up in America, I'd be a very different person because there was two sides to the coin in America. There's there. So yeah, sorry. Were they were they trying to? Was there any persuasion from the people you met in America that you had made? Did someone say to you, "You've made a mistake. You should have been. You should have no. stayed." There was no overt. It no, was just there was nothing like that. There were people who were very, very supportive and almost coddling of it. Mm. Um, sort of the same as there is in the UK. In my in my former progressive group of friends, they were very, you know, supportive of it. And then people who didn't really have an opinion on it, they didn't say anything about it. So I never really met any strong opposition whilst I was in America. I even volunteered at a couple of churches trying to see if I could maybe get uh, workplace sponsorship for immigration. Yeah. And even in churches, conservative churches, Catholic churches, old school churches, I still didn't run into any issues. In fact, I think the only place I ran into issues was probably California, which... Oh. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you started to question whether or not you'd done the right thing when you were in America. Mm -hmm. What happened next? I mean, you how long were you having these thoughts? Did you, when you did you you come back to the UK, you were still thinking I've made a mistake. So it was whilst I was in America, um seeing this whole other side of things that I started to think maybe I'd made a mistake because obviously this this was about 2015, 2016, 2017, across those years. So this was the start of um, Donald Trump's presidency. Mm. And there was all kinds of propaganda about him being transphobic and anti-LGBT and all of this kind of stuff. And of course, I believed it straight away. I thought, what a terrible, terrible person he is. But then I got speaking to people on the conservative side, people on the Republican side, and they cleared up a lot of the lies and propaganda. And I brought that back with me to the UK. So. I now had a lot of questions. And the moment I started voicing any of these questions or asking any of these questions, my little progressive friend group got smaller and smaller and smaller. And the um, the last nail in that coffin that really made me realize I've made a terrible mistake and I've been living in this fabricated reality is when this whole zealous obsession with the green movement started to really pick up in the UK. And like I said, the cars are my thing. That's all I've ever really wanted in life is to have a nice car, especially a classic. And um, I was quite, I started questioning that. And that was sort of the last progressive friend dropped me at that point, because how could you be a climate change denier? How could you? Except I just wanted to know what actually is it and how dangerous is it? And what is it without the media and the propaganda behind it? And um that was almost, I would say, the, that was the tipping point. I went from, I'm okay being a woman to, oh my God, I've made a terrible mistake when all those progressive people just dissolved around me. 
and now I'm out on my own. No more support from the gender clinic or anything like that either. They basically push me out the other side. I'm a successful statistic, and that's it. And now it's now I've got to figure out the rest. So you had been you had lived as a woman for how many years altogether? I think by the time that I actually finally socially detransitioned, I think it'd been eight years. Eight years. And what was it like? When 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 did the point come when you thought, okay, I'm going to return to maleness? So when that group of progressive friends dissolved around me and now I was suddenly alone, I'd come back from America with all these questions and now I had no friends to ask, uh, I thought, screw it. I'm not going to listen to any more of what they tell me I'm allowed to listen to. I'm not going to listen to any more propaganda or any more news media, any more politicians or anything. And I just went and did all the things that I'm not supposed to do. I went and listened to Jordan Peterson. I went and looked at conservative Christianity. I even the the Jehovah's who came to my door, who were also a big part in this, I listened to them. You're not supposed to listen to them if you're progressive. You're supposed to have a no religious callers on your door or something like that. But I listened to them, and then I let we we came in, we had tea and coffee, and we talked about the Bible, and that was where it really, really strongly started to come to the detransition resolution, um, particularly in regards to returning to Christianity, because when I was quite young, I was brought up Christian. And then the government, I don't know if you remember this, the, the government did that sweeping ban on prayer and hymns in schools whilst I was still in primary school. So religion was just taken out of my life just like that. And now I'd come back to it, and in particular, being honest, avoiding deceit, not telling lies, things like that really started to hit home. Um, and I think... I came to a realization at this point that I've got to do something about all of the terrible policies in this country, all of the, the terrible things that are being done in the name of progressiveness. And if every single one of my interactions is a risk of a conflict, that's not going to help me do that. Because being misgendered, of course, as a transgender is quite hurtful. And you want to confront or correct the person straight away. And that puts them in a defen defensive position because if they misgender you, they can get in all kinds of trouble for it. And having that sort of potential conflict on every single interaction was not going to help me make the country I'm in or my life any better. And the, I think the, the day when I finally decided was that day that I drove up to Swansea with a couple of the four Britain members from uh, down in Southwest. And at that point, I was like, I've got to I'm going to be talking to hundreds of people every single year. And it has obviously not been sitting well with me for a long time, this gender thing. I don't want that kind of confrontation with people every time. And I just decided at that point, yeah, I'm just going to go back to being socially male, regardless of what's going on in my pants or under my shirt. Grow a beard, put the deep voice back on, and just be approachable and be normal, so to speak. But normal's a weird word anyway. It is. So do you feel, I mean, you said something interesting there, that, that religion taught you or brought you to the thinking that you needed to tell the truth and, and be, sort of be authentic, if you like. Do you feel that you were living a lie on that? Not, not consciously, but do you feel that you were living a lie for those eight years? In hindsight, yes, because I, at the time, believed, well, that's it. Now I can officially call myself a woman. But, of course, the reality of it is that I can't bear children, um, you know, all kinds of other biological things and that I'd lived the formative years of my life as a man. So it, it, in hindsight, it really did feel very dishonest, especially since all of my interactions online, I also never told anyone the, about the transition. So it really did feel quite dishonest in hindsight. Um, to get a little bit personal again, Reese, if you don't mind, what's it, what was your romantic life like during this time? No, during um, the eight years and, and at the yeah. time it felt quite successful um i'd been in a couple of very long-term relationships uh one had lasted two and a half years i think the other one had lasted three years um and it was through those relationships that i actually went to america in the first place okay. but 
looking back on those relationships, I realized that a lot of it was trying to be somebody I'm not to fit into something that I'm not, you know, not really supposed to be. So at the time it felt like it was the right thing. But afterwards I realized it was just an indulgence in vice, really. I wasn't getting anything out of it other than stuff and contact and pleasure. So where are you you when you decided decided it's probably the wrong word, but you know what I mean. And it's when it, mm. when it became clear to you, I suppose is a better word, to become male again, to live in this male again. Did you? Is it a matter of taking more medication or stopping taking medication or what? What is the physical changes that you made to to at that point? So I'm still working a lot of that out. I spoke to my GP again, and you know it was very neutral on everything. Um, one issue that transgenders really need to be aware of, and I, I really hope to make people aware of it before they consider transition, is things like bone density can be greatly affected by the hormone level. So if you're not getting enough hormone, whether that be testosterone or estrogen, you can have problems with things like bone density and problems with mood and depression, weight gain, and weight loss even, sometimes things like that. So the doctor recommended put me on a very low dose of estrogen, which I'm still on now. I'm still trying to get a referral to just a regular endocrinologist to get back on some kind of normal male hormone level. So that's, um, I think it's been almost a year since that Swansea trip. So yeah. it, it take, takes a lot of time. And unfortunately, I'm, I'm still struggling a lot with the changes that were made to my body over that period of time. And how do you feel about yourself now? How do you feel about, do you feel more authentic? Do you feel, how do you definitely. feel about, yeah? Uh, I definitely feel a lot more authentic and a lot more genuine. And now that I've listened to all these people I'm not supposed to listen to, and I've seen a much more, I don't want to call it simpler reality, a much more um, realistic reality than all of these things you have to remember for the progressive reality. I've become a lot more calm, relaxed, open, approachable. Uh, some people would even call me charismatic. I don't know about that. <laughs> I don't want to blow my own trumpet. Just in general, everything's been a lot better. And are you openly detransitioning? I mean, if you go on, have you got social media accounts and things where you will announce yourself as, as someone who is detransitioning? Yes, um, I reach out on quite a lot of platforms to do that as well, because I think it's important that people see the sceptical side of transgenderism. And I've been banned from so many peer support groups and so many platforms, and I've been kicked out of meetings, um, transgender meetings, for expressing a negative view of transition. And the majority of the people who are in here are either still in their two years living in role or in the two years after surgery where everything feels great. So maybe in six or eight years they're also going to be going i wish i'd listened hopefully if i share my experience some people who aren't you know some people who are not quite sure why they're there or you know they've got doubts or issues along the way might stop themselves from making a decision they can't come back from but i'm hoping in a way to save people from from gender transitioning and how, what's the, I mean, you said you've been kicked out of groups and banned from social media, and I, I know what it's like to be banned from social media. <laughs> is that, how, how overt is the hostility? If you look at, for example, J.K. Rowling, and you must have seen what the, the death threats and things that she gets for being very, very reasonably, very politely questioned is, have you got that kind of hostility towards you? Is there threats yeah. of violence? Are you, is it that bad? It's quite nasty. Um especially from the online peer support groups, the organizers are very, very hostile. And something I've noticed about this, I think in my entire life, I've met maybe two people who transitioned and are still happy nearly 10 years later. Um, everybody else that I knew at the time that transitioned is sort of in a similar position to me now. Uh, don't, not that I talk to them anymore, but I keep an eye on their feeds and stuff like that. But something I noticed in all these peer support groups is it's almost predominantly male to female in the online support groups. And the moment I show any kind of dissent from the orthodoxy or that this hasn't worked for me or that 
you know, anything like that, any kind of doubt, it's almost as if I get an aggressive male response back. I, you know, I get the door slammed in my face. I get shouted at, I get sworn at. Some, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> sometimes I even get threatened. Um, and I've had random occurrences happen that the police say are just that random occurrences. Things like, um, eggs thrown on my car or mirrors being smashed off or new scratches appearing all down one side of it. Um, horrible reviews left on my business page and things like that. I've got all this sorted out now and it, it doesn't happen anymore because I've taken the necessary precautions, but being really out there with the detransition and not having necessarily an opinion whether transgenderism is real or not, but just being out there with how this doesn't work for me and it doesn't work for so many people has really sparked quite a lot of anger in the, the group of progressives and that I would have called friends back then and similar kind of people to that. You said you knew about two people who were happy after about 10 years after transitioning. How many are we talking about? So two would be a percentage of what, do you think? So I think in total I probably met it's very hard to recall all this because it's all a little bit of a haze. Probably about eight male to females and probably about two female to males through my whole time through college and that friend group and all that. And one of them I watched all the way up until um, probably almost a year ago now. I watched their feeds and everything like that. We weren't talking anymore, but I was just curious. Mm -hmm. So any feed that I could see, I'd go see. Are they doing well? Are they happy? And they seem to be happy. They're their partner fell very far down the progressive rabbit hole. They've got the, um, you know, the new pride progress flag. Oh, They've yeah. got that all over their profile. And the other one that I think is still happy in a way is the, the female to male one whom I'm trying not to mention any names because I knew them all, you know, quite personally. Um, still in that progressive mindset, still you know, basically making the walk towards communism, more or less. Um, but they still seem happy in their gender identity. And all of the others feel like it's been some kind of regret. A lot of them have lost touch with, and I wouldn't be surprised if I tried to get back in touch, I'd find out that they'd opted out or something like that. So, so if we're saying two out of around maybe 10, maybe a fifth would be... I, 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 the word I perhaps would use would be genuine. Um, yeah, genuine. I think genuine the, transsexuals. The, there may be a case of some cases being genuine. Yeah. Um, like I said, I don't have an opinion either way whether transgenderism is a real thing or not. But I think by and large it's been very damaging to a lot of people. But I, I think then again, they're still in that progressive place. And I think if they came out of it, they might have a different opinion. But like I said, I don't really talk to them, so I can't, I can't pry and figure that out. And I don't think it would be decent of me to do that anyway. And is there, is there a support group for detransitioning? Is there, I mean, do you have, are you in contact with other people who are detransitioning? Are there, because there's lots of groups for trans, for people who are transitioning. Is there a support network for people who are detransitioning? Mm, I think there is, but not that I've found locally. Um, there's a couple of web forums and things like that, but I find that the more I step away from that whole area that I was in, I keep calling it progressive, and it's, I don't know if that's yeah, the right way to describe it. Well, the, in, in topsy turvy world, it probably is. Mm, yeah. The further I step away from that, the less I find I need things like support groups the more okay. I find that I am pretty much all I need. So I, I guess I wouldn't really know if there is because I just haven't felt a need for it. That's interesting and actually quite positive. Everything's been a lot more positive since I detransitioned. Well, you I, said that you, yourself is all you need. That's a very, that's a very strong statement and one hmm. that I, I, I feel myself, to be honest with you. Um, you're the only person you have to live with for the rest of your life. Yep, that's pretty much the sum of it. Yeah, so if you like yourself, you're in a pretty good place. Yeah, and that, like that resonates with the people you talk to. If you're confident, yeah. if you like yourself, they feel comfortable and at ease and confident around you. Absolutely. It spreads a lot quicker than pessimism and depression does. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you see the future, Reese? What, what's your, what does your future look like? What do you hope it, what it is? What, what do you want out of life now? Where are you going from here? Uh, I want to slim down a lot and get rid of these annoying things on my chest. I am, by that was one of the other physical things, was having to wear a binder so that it's not as obvious. Um, I want to keep moving forward with the things I've got on the go right now. I've got my, my project cards on the go. I've got some big engines and some nice stuff that I don't want to disclose yet, but it's it's exciting and noisy. Um, I fix my body. I'm hoping maybe at some point in the not too distant future to look at adoption. Um, Cause I don't know if I'm ever going to settle with a long-term partner again. Um, maybe the right person hasn't come along, but you know, it's, it's a lot of criteria to be a conservative self-confident woman who also has absolutely no interest in intimacy. Cause I can't provide any of that anymore. And those that doesn't come together very often. Um, but I've come to terms with that. I'm fine with that. Um, and to work on this political side of things quite a lot as well. I'm hoping to be sort of part of the, the grassroots swing back to a more conservative Britain, smaller government, less regulation. And I can honestly see I'm going to have to commit pretty much the rest of my life to making that happen because uh, the, the, the other side, the progressive side, is quite strong and it's got a grip on almost everything. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. What message would you? Is there, what would you say to people in? If you could talk to your eighteen, your, your teenage self, um, and there are other, you know, you, we know the number of teenagers now who are going through this stuff. It's insane. It's it's a true epidemic. It is. It is. What would you say to them, Reese? Um, slow down. Take your time really think about this, really think about where you're going to be in 20 years. You may not think you want kids now, you may not think you you want all your stuff intact now, but in 10 years, you most likely will. It's, it's the same, we've all got a very similar body clock. We're all very rebellious at that age, and then later on we settle down, we want to start a family, we want to own a home, we want to create our legacy. And if you've rushed into it at this point, it's going to be really hard to create your legacy. Not impossible, but really, really hard to do it. Create your legacy. That's a that's a, a, a beautiful phrase. Mm. I've been thinking a lot about the legacy thing lately. Um, a lot of the youngsters in my family, since I've detransitioned and been more approachable and confident, they've been drawn to me. I've got uh, a nephew who looks up to me basically like his hero or something because of the kind of cars I drive because of the, the kind of cool toys I have. Like I've got a, a sim wheel for doing the racing games and stuff like that. And he really loves all that. And I take him to the airsoft range and he loves playing with all of the uh, BB guns and stuff like that. So he's really looking up to me and I, I like that. And I want to I wanna be able to create my own legacy as well as be part of theirs. Fantastic. What car do you drive, Reese? Oh, oh let's car. see. <laughs> so I've got, a Ford Granada Mark II, big square body. Um, I've got a little Mazda MX-5, tiny little roadster, which is surprisingly good fun. I only picked it up as an intermediate car, and now I could never let it go. Uh, and a little Mini Cooper, one of the newer ones. And that car is um, surprisingly fast. <laughs> Not my favorite, though. The Granada is my favorite. And, and that's the... Any car in the world, what would it be? Any what car, car what, what, what car would you have? Oh, that's that's a good question. I think I might want to go for a Volga 24, which is the uh, four-door sedan from the Soviet KGB era in Russia, for two important reasons. One, it's a constant reminder that communism happened and shouldn't happen again. And two, it's a big okay. square body sedan, so I can put a massive engine in the front of it and all that good stuff. You like the big? I like big square cars. Um, that's why I got the Granada, which is also a favorite car. It's hard to choose. It's like, you know, picking between your pets or picking between your kids. It's really hard to do. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to look up that, that um, KGB car. And that mm. <laughs> Reese, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for sharing your very personal story with us. Um, 
it you know it, it it we have so many i think that there's to me there are so many people who are looking for a place in the world and yeah. who are lacking in self-confidence and this is normal for teenagers i think they're looking uh, for somewhere to belong and this yeah, offers them something absolutely. it's a little insidious yeah and then you have this this trans activism group which is almost to me praying preying upon vulnerable young people uh, and and persuading them I'd say that sounds exactly right. Drastic for political reasons. And you know what's interesting to me is that a lot of these people aren't even transsexuals. Mm. No, it is, it's like the, all of the activisms going on right now um, on that side of things, the people that are advocating aren't even part of the group that they're advocating for. Yeah. It's yeah. bizarre. It reminds me of the uh, Black Trans Lives Matter march in London. And yeah. I think it was a load of um, white people. I don't yep. think there was a single black trans person there. So there's something, <laughs> you know, to me, it is an element of control and an element of reshaping society and making objective truths unfashionable. And this is, of course, the road to, you and I agree on this, I think, communism. That's yep. where I'm just going. That's a big reason I've become so politically active is the green movement, the identity movement, the race movement, they're all the 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 good intentions that pave the road to hell yeah. they all go straight to communism and a lot of people are just unaware of it and they need to be aware of it because communism doesn't work out well no it's no. got a really bad track record for the amount of people that have died and suffered under communism oh, communism reese i wish you nothing but the very best i'd love to see you in parliament one day as a, an mp for for britain perhaps um, yes, I'm definitely considering well. it. I wish you felt thank good, good. Please do. Just cleaning up my internet history a bit at the moment. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, listen, thanks, Reese. Thanks for sharing this with us. Um, I really wish you well, and do stay in touch. Do stay mm. in touch, and hopefully, I'll, I'll see you in person again. Yes, very that'd be good. All right, take care. Thanks, Reese. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Fantastic, and thank you it's so much, Therese. I mean, it's a really personal thing, um, the most fascinating conversation. And uh, again, I mean, my own view on all this is I do think there are a very, very small number of people who are happier and will be happier having undergone this transition. But as Reese says, this is a tiny number in comparison to those who are left unhappy by this. I do believe that we are, that there's a... a, a lobby a political lobby an extreme left political lobby exploiting people at their most vulnerable um and putting them through or the result is and the effect is to put them through irreversible changes in their bodies and their lives um and we need to say something we need to speak up against this it's very brave of reese to do so but we all must join reese and do the same this is insidious this is dark and this is preying on vulnerable people Thanks everyone for watching. I shall see you uh, back on my live stream on Monday night. And sincerest thanks again, Therese, for this fascinating discussion. Thanks everyone. See you soon.